welcome everybody to this uh, presentation, The People Behind Big Ben. Um, it's part of our Meet the Contractors series, uh, where you will have an opportunity to listen to Rory Smith, the stonemason for DBR. Welcome, Rory. Uh, uh, it's good to good to meet you. Um, there's a, sort of a couple of questions uh, that we've got here uh, to ask you. The first one, I was very interested to know about I said a little bit about the other projects you've worked on, but you have, I believe, worked on on the estate in, in, in other works before. Can you tell us a little bit more about the other projects that you've worked on on the estate? Oh, I can see some two pictures there of some of the work you've been doing. Hello. Yes. Um, yeah, I've been on the estate pretty much full time since 2011. Uh, the right. first five or six years of which were spent on the project you can see on your screen, the encaustic tile project. Um, I worked primarily in the Royal Gallery, St Stephen's Hall and the Central Lobby. Um, so I was there most of the time and from 2011 to 2017. And then I uh, sort of floated around on a few other jobs. I spent quite a long time on the courtyard restoration, um, did a bit of work in Westminster Hall. But basically since 2007, end of 2017, start of 2018, I've been full time on the Elizabeth Tower. OK, thank you. Um, can you just uh, talking about the stonemasonry part of your work? Can you give a sort of short history of, of, of Elizabeth Tower's stonemasonry work that's been done on it? The previous constant and then the previous conservation work that's been done on the tower over the last 160 years? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to sort of get into too much detail yeah. on the history, but sort of the things to note are, and you can see this from this um, etching we got, the tower was actually constructed from internally sort of leaning out. So it's built as a series of rings going up by a relatively small number of masons on the tower fixing it and a lot of masons at the bottom producing the stone. Um, but by building it in this sort of quite clever internal structure, sort of producing these rings of stone that went up into the heavens, it basically has thrown up certain problems whilst trying to work on the building after the event because it was never designed to be accessed from the outside. Um, so, you know, this restoration is one of the few times that the building's been covered in scaffold. Um, and, you know, it, the building doesn't necessarily lend itself to being, you know, repaired from, ex from the exterior. There is evidence of several previous sort of conservation efforts. Um, there was a lot of work done, particularly on the south clock face after the bomb damage during the Blitz. Um, and more recently in the 80s, there was a large restoration project, um, which is easily identifiable when you're up on the clock face by the types of stone they used and the sort of finishes they applied to it. Yeah, so it, it, sort of that's your that's your potted history of the work. Okay, today. thanks. So there's more to it than that, but yeah. So what? So talking about the damage that you've described. So what sort of damage to the stone have you, have you encountered on the tower? Was it was it better? Was it was it in better condition than you expected, or, or was it worse? Um, I mean, it sounds like a bit of a sort of political answer. It's as you'd expect. You know, the building's 150 years old, and there is a sort of quite a lot of damage all over the building but it is in pretty much the condition you would expect to find it in um when we first sort of started looking at the job we kind of we were looking at 250 300 stone we call them indents the kind of individual stone components that needed to be replaced um but once you know sir robert McAlpine installed an access scaffold um, and we could get up close to the building, have a really good look. And once the DBR cleaners had sort of got the, you know, decades of grime off the building, and we could really see what we're looking at. That 250 indents quickly went up to 500, then 700, and now we're kind of 900, getting on a thousand indents. So, although the condition of the building was as you would expect, the the scope of works did, you know, increase significantly. Um, and this image here shows as you start to look closely, you know, if you stand on the high, on the you know Westminster Bridge, it looks very cohesive and it looks like it's fine. But when you get close in these images, you can see the defects and, you know, you can see heavy carbonation, different types of mm. stuff used, um, failing mortar repairs, cementitious, you know, pointing, 
um, slightly inappropriate indents done at sort of previous interventions. Um, you know, there's just a, an inconsistency to uh, to the feel of it, which you don't get until you get sort of on the coal face. So um, some of the work has also involves taking stuff out, presumably the wrong uh, restoration, if you like, or we misguided didn't, restoration. We didn't go out of our way to replace previous work because we didn't like the stone, but it would have been nice to, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's there's a lot of it, and it's not there's nothing wrong with it. It's just yes. I suppose conservation philosophy might have changed a little bit, um, and maybe you know we've got to be pragmatic. You can only do so much. Um, I mean, you can look at this photo here that sh clearly shows the, the sort of greyish stone on the left of the screen. There's a very that's an eighties intervention. Forget about the colour of the stone. Look how proud that to sort of fine detail is the role at the top of the detail compared to the original stone and this is you know this is just due to erosion over 150 years um talking about the stone i think the next slide this sort of this shows what we're talking about when we talk about the type of stone um the original design of the clock tower was to be also built in church anston Unfortunately, we can no longer get Church Anston, so we want to replace it. We can't get it. They selfishly built a uh, housing estate on the quarry and, you know, reluctantly, we've had to look elsewhere. Um, in the 80s, they used this sort of greyish stone, uh, which is Clipsham, which is, you know, it's a limestone. It's, you know, it's not a bad stone in itself, but it just it's slightly the wrong colour. It's slightly it's got a different feel to it and it, it, mm. it ages differently from the uh, the original Anston. So for this yeah. sort of pass of works, we've used a magnesium limestone. So it's another limestone. Um, we've used KB stone because it's kind of it's more uh, it's closer to the original than the Clipsham. Um, and you can just see there are you know lots of examples of typical defects, um, all of which are sort of due to exposure to you know the elements and you know delamination where salt and frost gets into natural vents in the stone and over decades it sort of falls apart. Um, yeah I take it that the pollution is also going to be a factor as well in London. Yeah I mean obviously I, I think it's safe to say we're past the worst of that now. Yes. We're not dealing with smog anymore and there are less sort of coal fires and people aren't you know not every house has got a fireplace but yeah I mean it's still it's still an issue. You know, most of the images I've just shown you have been taken from the 25th lift of the scaffold, which is just below the clock face. And, you know, when you look at the kind of the level of detail up there, it's I mean, it's it's almost ludicrous. It's such an intricate design. But when we work on it, we're very aware that no one's ever going to see those stones. But we still have to treat every stone like it's you know, a showpiece. So just because it's at the top of the tower and possibly the mason who installs it is the last person who's ever going to look at it, we still treat every individual component like it's at street level and the world's going to see it. Yeah. Can you say, oh thanks, can you say a little bit more about the, um, the, the, the uh, how the stone, once it's come from the quarry, see we've got a picture of the quarry there, once it comes from the quarry when you're putting in new stone and how does it, how does it become the stone we recognise? We sort of take it back a little bit Going to the quarry is a fairly sort of significant part of the job. We've we've talked about stone selection, but even once you've established that we're going to do use Cadby stone, we you know the design team, which is made up of you know people from the contractor and the architects, Purcell, the architects, and representatives from Sir Robert McAlpine and myself, will go to the quarry. And this image shows very nicely actually the horizontal planes that stones. Sort of formed in over millions and millions of years. Um, this, yeah, the Cadby quarry is up in Doncaster, um, and all the stone on the Elizabeth Tower is taken from bed one, which is the sort of the bottommost bed, as you see in those images. Um, and you know, it's basically cut out of the ground with a great big eight foot chainsaw mounted on tracks, and then you know, it's sort of carried around site, carried around the quarry, great big, you know, 15 tonne lumps of stone. Um, 
and with the design team we go up and choose very specific blocks because it's not enough to just say we want a type of stone or even a type of bed within the stone we're looking for very particular stones and sometimes individual blocks from a quarry will be considered for very specific stones because if something's got a lot of detail you want a really consistent finish you want it to be free yes. of geological faults you want the color to be perfect um so you know and and the, the site that the height of the block and you know it's all there's a lot of thought that goes to it before it gets to us um and you know you can see from the size of some of those lumps you know they're you know they're easily going to be 10 15 tons um so we then send those blocks um down to a, a workshop in derby who cut all the stones into sort of six-sided blocks sawn six sides that's what we call it uh, there you go and that's what arrives on site and those blocks are cut every block is for a specific stone on this on the building um they're all cut sort of um, you know millimeter perfect so we really hope that i measured up the uh, the size accurately um and then yeah they're delivered from a workshop in derby to site and hopefully by this point they are manageable enough sizes that we can manually or with you know basic lifting equipment maneuver them around site can you say something about the, the technology um, today and how it's how it's changed in in restoring and putting the the stone into place from from what it was like in the past um well it's a very traditional craft um there's no getting away from that everyone who has sort of applied their trade as a sort of qualified trained stonemason has learned how to do it the hard way which is with a mallet and chisel that said power tools are great like you know a lot of purists turn their nose up at the use of angle grinders and drills and i can understand the mindset but at the same time i genuinely believe that if the egyptians had had angle grinders when they were building the pyramids they would have used them <laughs> you know they're not as romantic but they're quick they're efficient they actually take a lot of the burden off your body and they make stone masonry a, a practical trade if everything is worked by hand it is incredibly slow and and you know it's amazing when that does happen but not many it's not commercially viable so personally i embrace technology to an extent that said there's no way you can mass produce the details we're looking at on this building so technology is used to aid us but you still need the traditional core values of a stonemason to finish off you know this that stone on the screen now that john's working on you can't you can't do that without you know hammer and chisel if you, you know it's um it's it's essential to know how to do it properly but we can still use technology you know fairly fairly productively what, what's the most um ambitious um are some more pictures of some of the work you've been doing can, can you say a little bit about um some of the more ambitious and difficult tasks that you've encountered um well on the building like this every stone is unique some of them aren't as exciting as others but there are a lot of very impressive stones um i mean a stone like the one we're looking at on the screen you know that's there's a huge process that goes into into making that that's a very impressive stone um we did one panel which we've got images of uh, further on which yeah this one you know that's a rare stone like that stone it was worked by one of our carvers on site john it's it's very big and it is that actually is all hand carved there is nothing in that that can be Gosh. really sped up with you know any sort of modern technology um there are no there are no easy stones the big difference in this stone and the previous one you looked at really is scale this is a this was so big we couldn't actually the scaffold couldn't support the weight of replacing this stone as one so we had to install it as four separate stones yes. and then work the joints out of it um so it could be seen but you know it's such a highly involved and decorative building that every stone is pretty uh pretty impressive and um, 
talking about how, how you get how you get the intricate pieces of stonework from from the workshop you've just described what you had to do with that in that previous slide split it up into smaller parts so I sort of answered that partly but but how, can you explain the sort of process of, of, in, of installing um, pieces from the workshop having gone come from the quarry they've come to the bottom of the tower they're ready in blocks they've been carved the process of, in, of installing this and have you got some examples more examples of before and after yeah, I mean, we'll sort of, I'm sure we'll come to the actual how we produce the stones in a minute, but yeah, you're right. Cutting out the stone, fixing the stone is, you know, it's a skill in its own right, and it's every bit as skilled as the work that goes on in the bank shop. There's, you know, it takes a very careful hand to cut a stone out like that with a neat square hole that is, the joints are going to be tight and we're going to get the stone in, you know, with as little damage to the surrounding fabric of the building as possible. So cutting out stone is is a very intricate job, and it's you know it, it it's filled with peril. You know there's a, there's an awful lot of safety concerns with everything we do, but particularly cutting out. Um, you know we use also we use dust extractors to minimise that. Everyone's wearing full personal protective equipment. You know we were wearing face masks long before it became fashionable, um, and you know, when we cut out stone, we've got to be really respectful of the, the surrounding building. So this is a good example. This transom, which is halfway up the west elevation, we had no idea there was a whopping great hole behind it. So we cut out the stone because we know what we're looking at is damaged, but it's only an educated guess as to how far back that damage goes. So, you know, we have to have a, um, a very strong sort of working relationship, particularly with the Purcell, the architects, because we might at any minute turn around and say, you know, that stone we cut out. Well, actually, we now just cut out, you know, another stone and the scope changes all the time. Um, there's always a debate. And again, it's sort of conservation philosophy. There's always a debate about how much stone you should cut out. You know, you always cut out the damage, but how far do you take it? And every stone's different. Yes. So, you know, there's no there's no hard and fast rule to things like that. Um, this these photo that sorry the previous photo the clock face that just shows how much we're cutting out um, in occasion you know areas because you can't leave a stone that's potentially dangerous in and some stones are so weathered they've got to go and you know there's there's three or four meters of masonry in that which has all all come out wow yes um, and then once the stone's out and we're ready to put a new stone in and the next photo shows this. You know, these are these are big lumps of stone. Some of them. Um, this is actually a pinnacle on the southeast corner that we dismantled and then reassembled. So we didn't make a new stone, but we still went through the process of fixing it. If the stones are too heavy for you know a man or two to lift, we rely on you know block and tackles and straps. Um, when we're actually installing stones in the wall, we often build sort of shelves, timber shelves immediately below where we're installing them so we can literally slide the stones into the holes and again you can understand why it's important to have such well sort of proportioned square neat holes to receive the indents um, yes. because you don't yeah. want to be taking things like this in and out over and over again because they're heavy and you'll damage stuff um, yes you, you must have been affected by the weather as well I mean, it's london weather in the winter the rain and everything it was another factor I mean, you know, we work through pretty much all weather, um, but we can't we can't sort of use lime mortar or products like that in anything below five degrees because it just doesn't sort of, mm. the chemical reaction doesn't work. Um, and we do fix it's worth noting every stone on this building has been fixed with a, a lime mortar. Everything that's been pointed has been pointed with lime mortar and all the grout has been lime based. So we're not, you know, we're removing cementitious fixing and pointing and putting back lime because that's how it should have been done. We are adding mechanical fixings, stainless steel dowels and resin to sort of ensure that these stones aren't going to go anywhere. But quite frankly, we're fixing them in a way where that's, you know, that's just a comfort. They don't need it. We're doing a sort of st sturdy enough job that lime alone will do it. Um, so again, it's very traditional method, but we've tweaked it with a little bit of modern technology. 
I like uh, cementitious. I, I, I know that means cement, but I quite like some of this, the stonemasonry terms. The bankers as well, you mentioned I'll, earlier. Bankers I'll shop. Probably, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll yeah, probably say that's you, all right. <laughs> you won't understand, but I know what they mean, mostly. Um, then the last thing we do on the fixing front, um, that's what Alex doing in that photo, is he's just trimming in the photo. So the, the banker who's worked it in the workshop or the banker shop, after it's been installed, probably by a different mason, he will then return back to his work and dress it in so that it's just sort of just to get it perfect. He's snagging his own work in the wall just to make sure every edge lines up. Wow. So apart from cutting and and carving, there's a lot of other things that, that happen as a stonemason uh, on site. A lot of other types of work. Yeah, um, what you I mean, Andy, my uh, mason here, he's what he's um, doing, he's pointing. It's, you know, there's a lot of defective pointing on the whole tower. Some of it cementitious we're cutting out. Some of it's just aged and sort of fallen away and has left holes that are prone to creating further damage. So we have to repoint a lot of the building. We also defrass, which is the process of kind of removing friable material from the building. Um, we do a little bit of mortar, we do a few mortar repairs where the, the extent of the damage doesn't justify an indent. So we'll do a small um, mortar repair. We'll put you know, stainless steel pins with a bit of resin in it to shore up cracks if we're not, you know, Again, if it doesn't warrant an indent, but there's a bit of movement, we'll pin it. Um, and a massive part of what DBR have done in the Elizabeth Tower is just cleaning it. Um, we've got specialist cleaners who did a sort of a pass at the beginning of the job before any of the masons set foot in it. They do a pass at the very end of the job to clear up all of our mess and, you know, an awful lot of work in between. Um, you know, this is this is a, you know, a very typical stone. It's got a transom. If you look carefully, one of the uh, merlons is damaged. There's a crack running through the sort of the center of it. So is the mer merloin the, the metal? Is that no, the metal? merlon is the sort of the little uh, castellation detail running across the. Uh, the oh, stone. I see. Yeah, the little sort of like little yeah, sorry. Tower, little miniature castle towers. I can yes. see in the, in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we cut it out. You've seen this photo before. That's what was behind it, but we didn't know. So at this point. We um, we kind of we this is a good sort of place to talk about what actually happens in the banker shop, which is how we you know make a finished stone, um, you know on the on the in on the banker or in the banker shop. Um, before we do anything, we record the stone we're replacing. So we'll we'll take dimensions, we'll take photos. Some people will take sketches of what they're replacing. For really involved carving, they'll take plaster casts of it. Um, and then with all that data, you can you know do very one-to-one sc -one -to -one scale technical drawings, which you can turn into templates to mark it all up onto the sawn six sides block as they came from the quarry. And you know, and then it's time to commit and you know, using a combination of traditional and modern methods will you know, chip away at the stone, um, taking away the excess material and sort of sounds a little bit pretentious, but kind of letting the form come out of the block um, by removing more and more of the negative space. Um, which and everyone always says, you know, how how do you do that? And most masonry, actually, once you know what you're doing, it all comes down to chamfers and checks. You know, we we take out a controlled amount of stone in a very particular order and it sort of makes sense. That is the best way I can describe it. And yes. you know, that's what you go to college to learn. Um, obviously, yes. the more intricate carved details, that's, you know, that's almost another craft um, and sort of it's more sculptural. And there's a there's a bit more, there's a more artistic approach but they are still making a facsimile copy of the original detail. So it's still, you know, measurements and proportions and relations to other other parts of the detail. So how, how does it um, uh, make you sort of feel seeing seeing your team um, having all these things up and created on the tower, which presumably is going to last another 160 years or, or uh, before major conservation work? How does, how, does, how does the team feel about the work that you've done? I think, I mean, 
I think everyone is very proud. I mean, it's a very exciting job to be working on. It's Big Ben. It's iconic. Uh, myself and all of the guys who I work with would say that, you know, it is an impressive building. The level of work, the opportunity to do this level of work is rare. You know, there aren't many buildings with this much fine carved detail. Every stone is exciting. The dullest stone on the Elizabeth Tower is more fun than the most exciting stones on most of the jobs we work on. <laughs> so we're sort of spoil. And I'm now, this transom you see on the screen, my masons are bored of making those because they've made so many, but they also realise actually that's more exciting than most of the work they'll do on their next job. Um, so yeah, I think everyone is pretty proud of what they do. I'm certainly proud. I mean, when I took on the job as foreman, I kind of have reluctantly decreased the amount of practical work I do on the tools. So I'm very pleased that I still feel a lot of a sense of pride um, mm. the project as a whole. And, you know, when you look at these sort of before and after pictures um, and if you go, you know, you only got to look at that to realise how rewarding it is. You know, we still there are some stones on the building, some worked by me, a lot, most of them work by other people. And I still look at them and think, wow, that's that's really impressive. And I'm fairly jaded, you know, I've got, I'm not, um, I've got a fairly jaundiced view of everything, but I look at them, I'm like, that's, that is good. Yes, yeah, beautiful work. We are very, we are all lucky to be working in a building like this. Mm. Um, and you know, these, this, this, that stone, this stone on screen now, that's, that's up in the belfry. I mean, no one is gonna be able to see that, even with the best pair of binoculars that's just going to be a blur at the top of the tower and it's right below all the sort of beautiful gilding that other contractors have done and the cast iron roof that you know no one's going to look at that stone but actually in isolation that's an incredibly impressive piece of masonry it is. That, that any mason would be impressed by um let alone a member of the public and you know no one's ever going to see it but we know it's there and the building as a whole is you know is better for it Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about um, uh, how what, what an opportunity it was to, to be on this project and uh, and a really great part of your career and, and how, maybe ask you how you think young people could become skilled up to be stonemasons. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's important to bring fresh blood into industries like this. My story is fairly atypical. I, you know, went to university, did fairly well, had kind of generic graduate jobs, but was never satisfied. And then one day at work, I was reading the um, the obituary section of my local newspaper, the Mid-Sussex Times, and read the obituary of a man who lived in my village who was a, a stone carver. And it was a full-on eureka moment. Within 24 hours, I had an interview to go to the Building Crafts College in Stratford and you know, two weeks later, I'd quit my job and, you know, basically went to college, became a stonemason and here I am. You know, it took 15 years, but it, it was a very simple transition for me because I was inspired. But you can't rely on that. Um, there is there is definitely a shortage of masons. Um, there is a fairly sensible and logical career path for young masons, which is you do an apprenticeship um you know you're, you you get employment you're supported through an apprenticeship whether you do it on day release or block release and then you know you're working and you've got a qualification you've got a very rewarding career but there is a kind of a lack of awareness of these craft jobs and you know i know that adrian atwood the director of dbr is you know really pushing a sort of a scheme called the year of the master craft person um, which is in 2022, and it's all about utilising the existing Masons, especially some of like the older guys, to pass on their knowledge to the future generations. Um, and I think, you know, there needs to be more done to attract young people. Um, you know, there is, I think there's already a shortage of, of stone Masons. Um, I mean, I know that Westminster, there are a lot of stonemasons working in the Houses of Parliament at the moment, um, but that doesn't leave a huge amount of stonemasons working, you know, around the rest of London, the southeast of England. 
um, and you know, and and other other crafts are the same. Um, but there are ways into it for young people. Uh, it just it, we just need to kind of get a bit of awareness and get people interested. Mm. All right. Well, well, thank you very much for for that fasc fascinating guide around uh, the work you've been doing on on the tower. Thanks, thanks, Rory. I'm, I've got some. Can have a look now at some questions that people have been um, putting in on the uh, Q and A. The first question I've got here is. Um, how did you catalogue and track the stones? Was this done electronically? Yes, I, I, yeah, sorry, this was a, a point I probably should have made myself. It's, we started off with a list generated by Purcell, the architects. We then kind of reevaluate with a sort of stonemason's eye rather than an architect's eye, mm. the damage. Um, and eventually, once we've started the process, we use um, a bit of software called Zootech. So I'm forever walking around site with an iPad, you know, taking photos and inputting data into this app that kind of records direct, uh, correlates directly with a, the architect who got the same software. So as soon as a piece of work is finished and I'm happy with it, I'll say we've snagged it, I'll input that into Zootech and the architect will receive a notification. He will then come round and again, using the same software, record that he's happy with the stone. Um, and we can also use Zootech to track every stone through the whole process. So if it's in the banker shop being worked, I change the status on a you know tablet to in the banker shop or cut out waiting to be fixed. Um, so yeah, again, a good example of technology being used to um, sort of ease, particularly communication between us and the architects. And it is, you know, personally, it's been incredibly beneficial because the architect always knows what he needs to look at. And, but he won't come to fit, you know, he'll wait till there's a suitable amount to, you know, warrant a visit. Um, and yeah, it, it definitely makes communication very easy. Okay, thank you. Um, right, I've got a question from Chris. Is it the case that you could tell which of your team cut which stone? I sort of always knew because generally I told them which who was doing what stone. But yeah, I mean, you can. To a greater or lesser extent, sort of you get a feel for different masons um, finishes and techniques um, for better and worse. Um, but generally, you know, we're all working to the same standard. It's not a it's a very creative craft but you shouldn't necessarily be able to, you know, no one's got a signature you know, chisel mark. Um, so yes and no. OK, uh, the question from Elizabeth, while I'd imagine it changes over time, roughly how many stonemasons are working on the project? What other trades are involved? Um, I think we DBR would have an, I mean, it does change hugely from probably five to 15, 16. Um, so the average is probably eight, nine, 10. Um, and then additional to that, we've got stone cleaners. Um, we've you know often got a couple of them. Uh, and then the other trades are other contractors. So there's, you know, guys doing the, the glass, there's, you know, roofers, there's, you know, any number of other trades on site. But um, for us, there's, you know, fixer masons, banker masons, cleaners, and then sort of skilled multi-trades. Um, and yeah, probably an average of nine or 10 people on site at any time. Okay, thanks. A question from Kath. Um, when the stone has been quarried, how uniform do the blocks tend to be? Are there sometimes cracks or colour changes that you find after carving? Or once you get down to block size, can you be fairly sure it's consistent throughout the block? Colour, you will see sort of running horizontally as it's naturally bedded. Um, you will see differences in colour, you know, within inches of each other. And you kind of just accept that it's a natural product. You're not looking. I think the world would be very dull if everything was consistent. So that's not a problem. You do find natural vents and sometimes unnatural vents and stones have to be discarded. Um, I don't think we've ever dismissed a stone because of its colour, but that's why we go to the quarry to inspect the blocks before they're delivered. 
Um, but yeah, you can be carving a block and people will have spent weeks on a carving. And then when they get quite close to the end, they uncover a horrible, you know, vent or something that you couldn't <laughs> see from the outside of stone. Mm. And, you know, there are things we can do, but sometimes you've just got to be like, well, start again. Um, there's, there's no, the, the, not everyone can be salvaged. You're not under pressure of time in that sense. I mean, that's me asking because you have to do the work. You have to do the quality, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we it are, takes it takes. Mm. We, are uh, we are working to deadlines, but at the same mm. time, it's, you know, it's a it's a craft you can't mm. there's no point in trying to rush people if you rush people they'll make mistakes so what you need is the right people working with the right attitude and the right atmosphere and that's something that you know dbr as a company work hard to kind of maintain and to facilitate because if everyone's working in the same direction you know you don't need to you don't need to crack the whip that hard um, if people are positive. OK, uh, Louise is asking a question here. Um, she says, first of all, fascinating talk, Rory. Thank you. And beautiful stonework, too. I understand you've taken on some apprentices to assist with the conservation of the stonework. How long does it take to learn these specialist skills, especially carving something so detailed like the portcullis? Um, frustratingly, you never stop learning um, the sort of the formal apprenticeship takes about three years but I'm nearly 15 years into it and I'm you know I'm still learning and I that's, that's so cliche but it really is true um you know you you get masons who've been we've got a mason who's been working as a mason his whole adult life and he went back to city of guilds to learn carving you know there's always more to learn so and that's where the having kind of some of the older masons taking younger masons under their wing is so beneficial to everyone um so yeah three years to get competent enough to hold your head high on a site and then a lifetime to nail it yeah so the question here from uh, some anonymous um the scaffolding seemed to have stairs only on one side of the tower is that right and sufficiently practical i assume they are on the non-weather side no the stairs are on the side nearest the offices um, because that's probably there are to be fair there is a staircase on both sides of the tower there's a very practical hacky staircase near the offices and a slightly less you know slightly tighter staircase on the other side there is also a hoist so um, the stairs are used as little as possible because when you're going up 31 lifts with a tool bag um, it doesn't matter how scared of heights you are a, a hoist definitely is yes. appealing safe yeah yeah and chris asks the question uh, is it the case that you could tell which of your which of your team cut which stone so has it got as a personal is, is, it, is it is it a personal signature i think is what is oh well people asking. traditionally people used to put their banker marks on the back of stones um people still do yeah. it um, yes. and it's only it's quite often your initials and there are, you know, the Worshipful Company of Masons have got a kind of a database of Masons banker marks. So in theory, if you find one, you can cross reference it with them. Um, but people generally only do it on stones they're particularly yes. proud of, I think. Um, so it's it's you say that because I know from doing the tours of the palace that there are, and you, I'm sure you know this, there are, there are some marks from the, um, the late 11th century in Westminster Hall. There are some stonemason marks and we often point that out to people when we do the tours well it used to be much more prevalent because it's how you got paid um yes whereas we don't yes. worry about that now we do a time yeah. sheet <laughs> modern ways do you have to next question is um do you have to climb up the it's anonymous do you have to climb up the stairs every morning down for lunch up again <laughs> I refer you to the hoist. Um, <laughs> it was at one point there was a portaloo halfway up the tower, um, and at one point I think in January I was walking up the tower two or three times a day to be healthy and pious. But that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> so a question here is from um, somebody who remains anonymous. Uh, where does Cadeby Stone come from? Uh, just outside Doncaster, um, which is north. Uh, is that the Midlands or North or Yorkshire or Derbyshire? South, South Yorkshire. Yorkshire, yeah, yes. North, north of England. Thank you. Um, 
question from Kath. Is the stone you use fossiliferous? Which I think must have fossils in it, presumably. And does that present any problems for the craftsman? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's, po it's possibly an interesting question for a geologist. Um, yes. We don't have uh, a lot of problems with fossils. You get sort of harder deposits of calcites in the stone, um, but you don't get, you know, or, well, not in my experience, um, fossils. OK, do, a question from Tim. Do what do you attribute the more careful and refined converse, converse, conservation, I think is what, what, what Tim do. do what do you attribute the more careful and refined conservation techniques employed today compared to previous decades? Um, it, it changes, you know, like anything, there are fashions. What is sort of in vogue now as in conservation isn't the same as when I started, and that was relatively recently. Um, so, but it's as much how architects and, you know, designers implement it is what their thoughts are um, there are lots of this you know there are endless debates about conservation philosophy and there's you know organizations like spab are very involved and but at the end that's of the day saving. but that's what the idea, that's saving yeah, the yeah, society yes. for the protection of ancient buildings so protection of ancient buildings yeah um, and and there are you know lots of charters you can read up and they all make very valid points, but you've also got to be pragmatic, especially on a building like the Elizabeth Tower. You've got to look at safety. If something's going to fall down, you've got to do more than just, you know, controlled decline and things like that. So there is, you know, there is there is very good practice in place. It's not necessarily the practice that was fashionable 15 years ago. And who knows what we'll be saying in another 15 years. But when you measure up the need to protect you know, iconic buildings with, you know, safety and cost, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. Like, I personally think we're a bit doing a, a very good job. OK, uh, thanks. And so Lucy was asking um, a very good question. Are there any female Masons working on the tower? Yes, there are. Um, we have many. We have a female apprentice at the moment. Um, she's not the first female mason she's probably the last female that's done this job because we are getting close to finishing um you know we had a carver with us for quite a long time who has left to do very very interesting things um so it does happen i've worked with you know quite a lot of female masons over the years obviously they are you know underrepresented but they definitely exist thank you i think i'll just check to see if there are any more questions i think we might have come yeah, I think I think we've more or less covered um, uh, most of the questions, just about all of the questions now. So um, just remains for me to say uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. That that was a really uh, illuminating talk and at times discussion um, and um, and thanks for answering all, all of the questions so thoroughly. Um, so it only remains for me, to, apart from thanking Rory, to thank all the support staff for, for making this happen. And also thank you for your questions that were really interesting. And I'll just remind you that if you want to have more news about the Elizabeth Tower conservation project, uh, um, um, you just go on the link on the right hand side called the Big Ben newsletter, which will keep you up to date and future also talks from uh, from um, other other contractors work, working on the building as well. We've got one or two of those coming up shortly. And don't forget to feed out, fill out the feedback form at uh, on the link, which is also on the link as well. So um, thanks very much. Thanks for all the people helping to put this together. And um, yes, and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. So bye for now. Bye. Thank you.